Okay, we're just going to switch right up to uh, Abe Burmeister, who is one of the co-founders of Outlier. Um, and in, in my daily life, I bike commute a lot, and uh, Michelle actually brought Outlier to my attention uh, several years ago. And I've just been, we've both been very interested in following what he's been doing. Um, and I think he's going to share a really interesting perspective with us because he comes from outside the outdoor industry. His professional background is from graphic design and he's running an animation company. So uh, it's a really interesting um, outsider's perspective that he's going to be sharing with us up next. Hello everybody. Welcome. Thank you. Um, like I said, my name is Abe Burmeister, founder of Outlier. Um, and what Outlier is really about is, is trying to create the future of clothing, which is kind of an audacious thing to say, um, especially since six years ago, I knew absolutely nothing about making clothing. I, I was a graphic designer, and I spent all day staring at a computer screen. And um, maybe because I was spending so much time staring at a computer screen, I started riding my bike around the city a lot. Um, and it was amazing, it was a really liberating experience. I was like, wow, this is, I grew up in New York, so I was born and raised there, and it was a totally different way to experience the city, and I felt healthier, I felt better. Um, I, I loved it, but I started to have all these problems with my pants. <laughs> like, I just started, like, I was destroying my jeans. I was literally going through a pair of jeans like every two months or something. And, um, and I also had problems as a freelance graphic designer going to certain clients. Some clients I could go to in jeans or, or almost nothing, really. Um, <laughs> And other clients, I had to get really pretty dressed up, and I'd want to ride my bike, and I couldn't because I was afraid to destroy my nice wool pants, or I was worried that it might start raining. And you know, I wanted something that I could handle the elements, that I could bike through the snow, bike through the rain. And so I said, "Okay, that's cool. I'm going to go shopping. All right? Like I'm, I'm a good American. I know how to go shopping." Um, and so I started looking, and I figured I'd spend a day, or, you know, shopping, and I'd come back with an amazing pair of pants, and um, I couldn't really find anything. Um, I did actually find, uh, it was funny enough, a pair of Prada Gore-Tex pants that I, I thought was the answer. Um, they, were, they were impeccably cut, you know, Gore-Tex. Uh, you know, I, I put them on and I was like, this is great. Um, and then I wore them. And um, you know, I wore them to work and it was kind of cool biking in. Um, it wasn't that bad, but then I, you know, I was indoors for, for a while and I was like, this is not what I expected is like the first of all the whole office could hear me coming right? <laughs> it's really loud and it, it was really hot and I was like okay this is maybe not gonna work maybe when it's a you know rain shower like I can do it but um so I spent a lot of time going to outdoor stores this tent and trails in New York City which is my personal favorite in, in New York at least but um you know, I, I just started looking and looking and looking and I was like there's got to be something here but you know I found A, that, that like I didn't love a lot of the fabrics and B, there's these freaking logos on everything. I was like, what, am I in a stockyard or something? There's a logo on everything. Um, and um, there was also like a lot of times just like these weird extra details that I'd be like, why is that there? I just want a pair of pants to wear to work. Like why is that detail on there? I'd be like, this is 90% of the way there and then there's like a zipper across the front or something. Um, so. You know, I, I looked for a long time and I hit this classic entrepreneur moment where it's like, wow, you know, like, if I want these pants, if I really want these pants, I'm going to have to figure out how to make them myself. So this is uh, about six years ago, so it was before Maker's Row, it was before Kickstarter. Um, so I went here. So this is the Fashion Center Information Kiosk in the Garment District in New York City. Um, and so if you see that big building behind there, um, the Garment District is basically a bunch of buildings like that, and um, they used to be 100% filled with factories. Um, they're not anymore, but there's still lots and lots of garment factories, dye houses, like, it's a pretty amazing place. And, and it's, it's two blocks from Times Square, which is absolutely insane. Um, and it's, the, the reason it's still there and it's still vibrant and there's 50,000 garment manufacturing jobs in New York City is because New York City is where the garment manufacturing industry began. Um, the Singer Sewing Corporation was based in New York City, and at one point, 90% of the manufactured clothes in the United States were coming out of New York. I mean, you have to realize that this is when people used to make their own clothes, right? So if you lived on a farm, you sewed up your own clothes, or you went to a tailor and they made the clothes for you. Um, so I really just dove into the garment district and started asking a lot of questions and trying to figure out how to make these pants. 
And one of the things in that, that year of shopping I had found was shoulder. I found this one fabric in a garment, and I was like, this, it was like a shoulder dry skin, double weave, and I was like, I, this is the fabric. I, like, I think I could take this fabric and make amazing pants, but nobody's doing it. Um, so I went to Scholler and convinced them to sell me a roll of fabric and started, uh, took that to the garment district and had it um, sewn up. It was a lot of uh, phone calls and knocking on doors and asking a lot of questions, but eventually I walked out of there with a single pair of pants. And I was like, okay, cool, what do I, what do, I do next, right? And so I'd gone from like an idea to, uh, to a pant. And I, this is actually the most important part. Uh, it was like one of the hardest lessons of my life is that ideas are worthless. Like you have to execute them, right? You have to kill the idea, and then when the idea is dead and you have an object, then you can—that's when you start, right? So I had a pair of pants, and I, and I loved them. I wore them, and I started thinking like maybe other people might want this product. Maybe maybe there's more to it than just a, a single pair of pants. And I started asking people and talking, and and one day I walked into my local coffee shop where you know I go every day and. Um, I used to love pouring coffee on, on the pants to show them off because I was like, wow, look at this, it just rolls right off. Um, and the barista was like, hey, Abe, you gotta meet this guy, Tyler. He goes to um, our other location and he's doing exactly what you're doing. And Tyler was, uh, he had just started, you know, he'd been working in a record store and he had just started working at a shirt company. Um, and he would bike every day to work over the bridge and it was about 10, 15 minute commute but it was a pretty tall bridge and it was enough to work up a sweat where he'd have to change his shirt every day. And he's like, this is insane. Like, why do I need to change my shirt after biking 10 minutes? Um, so he had actually been starting to talk to some of the same people I was talking to and was, was just really beginning to develop, um, well, he'd actually developed a shirt that didn't work, but you know, we were, we were dealing with exactly the same issues. So we started talking and we said, all right, you know, maybe we can do this together. Uh, maybe we can start a company. And so then we were like, okay, let's figure out how to do this. And like, we're like, how do you, you know, we gotta figure out how to price this stuff. And I was, we, that was the first hard lesson. We were like, wow, these pants are gonna cost like at least $300, like maybe 600 if you're selling it to the fashion industry. Um, and we're like, that's, uh, I don't know, what are we doing here? Um, and we were like, is there, you know, I, I started thinking to myself, I was like, you know, I bought $180 pairs of jeans before. I was like, if I can get it to a price that I could actually buy, then maybe there's something there, maybe there, there's a value. And um, we started thinking about the, the structure of the industry and we're like, wow, you know, so like you wholesale something and there's the margin of the wholesale and it's not that big and it, you know, it varies. It's, it's bigger in some parts of the industry than other parts. And then the same side, on the retail side, it's again like this crazy multiplier. In the fashion industry, like, you know, there's retailers that are tripling the price of things when they get them. Um, so we're like, what about if we just kind of sell it direct, like at, at some price in between the wholesale, because we're gonna do more work to sell the garments, but, um, but less than the retail price. Like, can, can we get this garment down to something that we can understand? And uh, we didn't really know it at the time, but you know, this is like going, the direct, and I put this slide in here just to kind of reinforce, because I think the outside industry maybe has missed this, but like, this is like the massive mega trend of clothing over the last 30, 40 years, you know, in the gap started it and you have like the limited brands and all that and then you have the fast fashion companies like Uniqlo and Zara and like their entire business is about cutting out the middleman, cutting out the multi-brand stores and then what you have now on the luxury end is like those companies are very publicly saying like we don't want to sell to department stores anymore so Louis Vuitton is almost exclusively through their own boutiques, Christian Dior um, and the, those companies Prada like they're all very, very public that they really just want to be a direct sales channel. Um, and they're building their own stores and they're not even doing that much on the web. So we had no ability to build uh, you know, a store like The Gap or anything, but we, we knew how to build websites. We knew how to build websites a lot better than we knew how to build clothes actually. We didn't really know how to build clothes. Um, so we built a website and we're like, yeah, I think if we put this online, I think we can sell these pants for around 200 bucks and, and maybe it'll work. And, um, and then we were like, okay, now we gotta figure out how to make them. And, and uh, I guess we underestimated the internet a little bit because uh, all of a sudden this, we, a friend of mine called me up and he was like, hey man, I was just talking to a friend of mine and I showed him your website and he's gonna blog about it. And so he put up this one line uh, blog post with the photo he took from our website and we were like, all right, cool. Like this is like validation, I guess. Like, um, except that uh, it was better than validation. Like it started, uh, spreading across the web. 
right? It showed up on all these other websites. So Core 77 is here. PSFK is more like an ideas marketing website. High Snobbity was a um, streetwear type website. And all of a sudden we were like, wait, people want to buy these pants and we don't even have them. Uh, we actually didn't even have a uh, mailing list. So we just put up a quick button and we're like, okay, uh, email us like, and uh, we'll get back to you. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, eventually we, uh, we made about 100 pairs of pants. Um, it took a few months after that publicity and we, uh, you know, we just put a PayPal button up is actually how we started. Um, and we stuck them up on the website and we uh, sent an email out to our mailing list. Uh, we sent it out about midnight because we we're both working full-time jobs. And we're like, God, maybe when we wake up, well, somebody will bought something. And um, crazily enough, somebody in Australia bought something like a few minutes after we sent out the email and we're like, whoa, okay, <laughs> something's happening here. Um, and so like we really, we went from a, a pair, one single pant to, to pants. We were, we were selling pants, a few pants. Um, and we started thinking like, okay, what's next? Like, you know, we're still working full-time jobs and we got to figure out uh, what to do. And, and it, it actually, like the path came from this discussion I was having like earlier, actually before I met Tyler. And I was emailing fabric vendors and trying to figure out, like basically pretending I had a company. Um, and one of them wrote to me and was like, hey, are you gonna be at OR next week? <laughs> and I was like, you know, I didn't want to admit that I had no idea what, what OR was. So um, I started to Google it and it's probably the hardest thing in the world to Google. Um, but, Eventually, I figured it out, and um, and we went out to uh, to OR, um, and what happened is we it was like this crazy moment for us because you know we've been exploring technical fabrics, and then we were like, wow, this is like the wonderland. There's all this stuff, and what was amazing to us is I had just assumed like, oh, you know, the best outdoor fabric it goes into the most expensive outdoor clothes, and I was like, there's all this stuff that nobody's using that is. Here, you know, like very few people were using the shoulder stuff, and there was a whole world of stuff that just people that I was like, this is the best, and I think it was just because we were doing like, a, and this is just instinct, um, like what the old garmentos in New York called shopping by hand. You know, we were shopping with a slightly different criteria, it's just like grab the fabric, feel it, touch it, listen to it, um, and and we we're looking at these fabrics with a slightly different criteria, um, and. We were like, okay, this is amazing. We want to do this. And the other thing that we realized really early on is that you know, our first product was very bike focused. Um, and we dabbled a tiny bit with that, but we realized really early on that we did not want to be a bike brand. Um, that it just wasn't, a, you know, we, we ride our bikes every day, but it's not like we're, we're, we weren't in the bicycling lifestyle. We wanted a product so that we wouldn't have to think about the bike. Um, so we came up with this idea of tailored performance and it was really at the early stages just about going to OR, shopping by hand, finding fabrics we could take back to New York and make really classically cut clothes um, and put them on the internet and hopefully people would buy them. Um, so you know we did things like take, go to the merino company and, and buy a finer grade of merino that's more expensive and a little bit heavier. Um, and sew it up into a really simple t-shirt. You know, no, no flat lock seams, no logos. Just make a really simple t-shirt with the best possible fabric and, and tell that story on the internet and people bought it. Um, and, you know, I'm wearing one right now. Um, and, you know, eventually, like, we got all the way to the, the pinnacle of a tailored garment, you know, like how to make a sport coat. Um, and we also started digging into the history books a lot. Like, so we, this is um, what we call supermarine cotton. It's basically like a 21st century version of Ventile, which is a fabric the British invented in World War II. Um, their fighter pilots were getting shot down into the North Sea and dying of hypothermia, so they needed some sort of highly water resistant, they called it waterproof at the time. You, you can't do that anymore. Um, but it's, it'll keep you dry for a couple hours and it's 100% cotton. It's just highly engineered cotton fabric. And we found a company in Switzerland that was still making this fabric and adding a DWR, a really good DWR to it, which actually makes it way better than it was in like the 50s and 60s and 70s when it was actually a popular fabric. Um, and then eventually like, you know, this is amazing, like, but you know, we, this is uh, what we call our Merino Co. 
Um, and it's a fabric we actually were able to develop, which has been incredible. So, you know, it took about five, six years for us to get there. Um, and, and really, we were trying to make this for most of that time. Like, we made a Merino t-shirt. We're like, this is amazing. We're using 17.5 micron Merino, and we're making a great t-shirt. And we're like, all right, now let's make a button-down shirt. Let's find a woven 17.5 Merino. Um, there's lots of woven 17.5 micron wool out there, but it all goes into suits, right? And um, we couldn't find anybody for the longest time that would make us a shirting fabric, um, but eventually we got there. Um, and so that was really like how we started. It was just taking fabric from the outdoor world, sewing it up in a way that spoke to an urban market, and um, it was pretty amazing. But at a certain point, we started thinking, we're like, how the hell did we get away with this? Kind of like, 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 how did we get through there? And so I, you know, I spent a lot of time going back and forth between pieces of the outdoor industry and, and the urban world. And, and back in uh, 2009, um, this is something that really stuck with me is uh, Snooze had their, their 25th anniversary. And they had this tiny little graphic in the corner somewhere that, that showed what comparable products cost in 1984 and 2009. Um, and the prices hadn't changed very much. You know, they were comparing Osprey packs and Merrill boots, Sierra Designs tent, North Face sleeping bag, and, and the prices have gone up slightly. But um, but if you adjusted for inflation, like inflation, they should have more than doubled, right? So I, I graphed it out here. Right? Basically, you know, it's not scientific; it's for products. But like, the prices in the outdoor industry are increasing uh, a lot slower than than the rest of the economy. Um, and again, it's not scientific, but it seems right looking at it. And, and what it means is that it means you can look at it a lot of different ways. You can say, hey, the outdoor industry is delivering much better value to their customers, right? They're keeping the cost down below inflation, and that's amazing. Um, but if you look at it the other way, like the outdoor industry is kind of giving up on the top end of the market that they once had. It's not even a market that they that never existed. It's like inflation adjusted, they're just giving up the, the higher priced items and, and letting that part of the market slide away. Um, and you can also look at it in terms of how, how markups are compared in the outdoor industry versus in other industries. Like, you know, I don't know every single company here, but every time I talk to an outdoor company, I'm shocked at how low the markups are, uh, which is great if you're talking about delivering value to the customer. It's amazing, and the fact that it's warranty product is even more amazing. But the fact is that, like, it means there's less money circulating through the companies. There's less money going to the design. There's less money. Uh, there, there's less flexibility, really, inside the company because you're talking about a, a fashion brand. They just they're charging a little bit more, and and there's a lot more flowing. It's like lubrication going through the company. It allows them to act freer and do different things. Um, the other interesting thing about the outdoor industry that to me is like, I feel like, like, like how many people in here have read Mike Parsons' Invisible on Everest? How many people have heard of it? Right, like this is like, there's only one book about the history of outdoor garments in the, the world. Like there's books about like companies from 1968 onward, right? There's only one book about the history of outdoor garments, right? And that's, that's Mike Parsons' Invisible on Everest, right? And, People forgot about it. This is actually George Mallory's, like photos of George Mallory's uh, expedition in uh, 1924 to Everest. Um, so, you know, people think Mallory was the first, uh, at least first white man to reach the top of Everest. He didn't make it down. Um, but um, what's really interesting is if, I, I love looking at the clothes that they're making because, they, you know, they're, they're basically suits. Um, they're actually, they're completely, they're bespoke, like all this clothing is completely bespoke and it's made by Seville Row suit makers. Um, and it doesn't look like you could get to the top of Everest in it, but in fact people have built replicas of these garments and, and summited successfully um, and come back down. And what's really interesting is they said that in some, from certain perspectives, it was actually a better experience. Um, and part of it because it's bespoke clothing, it's custom made, it moves incredibly well because every single garment is custom made for the person wearing it. Um, basically, like as soon as you stop moving, they suck. You know, you'd much rather be in a down jacket. Um, but they said as, as long as you were moving, it, it was actually really nice. It was actually a little bit lighter and, and adequately warm and really well thought of engineered garments. 
And I think that there's a real reason for it, because if you think about a three-piece suit, most people associate a three-seat suit as being this really constrictive, like unuseful garment, and that's how they're constructed now. But the three-piece suit is actually the original layering system, right? Like what people were wearing when everybody in the world wore a three-piece, or every man was wearing a suit, it was like a layering system. You had a base layer, you had a shirt, um, you had your vest, you had your jacket, and you could have an overcoat. Um, and it was really well designed to stay warm. And there's a really good reason for this, um, which is uh, before central heating, houses were cold. There was, there was not as much distinction between the indoor and the outdoor. Um, you know, the roof over your head is great. It keeps the rain out and the walls keep the wind out, but it, you know, you're gathering on a fire. And if you ever gather on a fire and it, you know, it doesn't actually heat much beyond like five feet around it, right? It doesn't matter if you're indoors or outdoors. Um, so historically, like really like the, the clothing that people wore was, was, there was not that much separation between the clothes that people wore outside and the clothes they wore inside. It was, you know, there was obviously like ball gowns and weird things, but for the most part, like when you were talking about clothing, you were talking about clothing that, that worked in cold situations. Um, and then over time, like when, when central heating came around, the fashion market said, oh my God, we don't have to worry about all this outerwear anymore. Like we can just focus on like what we're into, which is like the clothes we're wearing inside and in these comfortable situations that look great. Um, and so you have this separation of the market. Um, and, and that mostly went to the outdoor market. Like the outdoor market started really emerging and there's this massive overlap between outerwear and the outdoor market. Um, and what's really interesting is like a lot of the customers for outdoor gear are really just people in the city who want a good jacket, right? And that's why they go and buy an Arcteryx or a North Face or Patagonia. It's like, because it's designed to keep them warm. It's a better jacket, it's better engineered. And a lot of the fashion brands just aren't really delivering uh, on that level. And I think it's, a, it's interesting for you guys, I think, is if you start thinking that you're not just an outdoor company, but you're making jackets for everybody. Like, it, it opens up the world of design challenges. And so, you know, at Outlier, we're really at this like funny place where we, we don't really do that many, that much outerwear. We do a little bit, but we're really at this sort of weird intersection of the outdoor and what I call otherwear, I guess, for lack of a better word. Um, so that's Outlier, and that, that's how we, you know, we kind of like went from, uh, from being a, just a pair of pants to being a company. It was like kind of navigating this space, um, taking a lot of fabrics from the outdoor. And, um, and that's great. And it, it, took us, it took us a good way. But we started thinking like, all right, wait, there's got to be more to this. Like, we got to learn what's up. And like, you know, how, how are we as a brand? And, you know, we have a funny relation to branding. Like, when I think of branding, like, the first thing, and I'm an outlier, I don't, I'm not saying anybody else in the world thinks this, but, you know, I think of ownership. I'm like, I, I can't have clothes with freaking brands on them because I feel like I'm a cow and, like, somebody else owns it. Um, I think, and this is a guess, but to me, I think a, a lot of the outdoor industry really looks at, at the brand as a piece of advertising like a, a, as free advertising and, it, and it's free advertising that's necessary because the margins aren't there to pay for large amounts of advertising that other companies might be doing. So it's almost essential. Like you can't take that, that brand off because there's no money to pay for advertising on somewhere else, right? Um, but what we really did when we thought about branding at Outlier was that, you know, we wanted to take it off the outside. We knew that, but we also wanted to sign our garments. So that's really how we look at, at the branding and how we do it is we're gonna take a garment and sign it. And, and it's prominent branding on the inside usually. We're gonna say, you know, we stand behind our clothes, we're putting our mark on there like a signature so that you know that we're, we're behind it. Um, and it's always on the inside, never on the outside. Uh, and then we started thinking like, well, you know, we're making products without branding. Like how, how are we, how can we be distinctive? Um, and so we started thinking about like really classic products that like uh, there, there's certain products that, that transcend any kind of mark and that sometimes they have a brand mark on them on the outside, sometimes they don't, but you can look at them and know even if that mark is invisible. I think that Chuck Taylors are really interesting because it's probably one of the earlier instances of pretty big branding, but they put it on the 
inside of the ankle, right? There's a big star, like Chuck Taylor's star, but it's not on the outside of the shoe, it's on the inside. It's actually really hard to see. Um, and so we started thinking about these products and, and we focused on a couple. Like we, we started thinking a lot about the Levi's 501. And there's, there's some amazing things about this pant. Like it's, it's barely changed in 120, 130 years. So there's a couple of little design details have changed. The way it's manufactured has com changed completely. Uh, but it's, it's almost identical to like what people were making in the late 1800s. Um, and the other really fascinating thing about the Levi's 501 is it's a super technical product. Now, the jeans are everywhere now, and you don't think, of the, you think about it as the least technical product, but it was patented, right? They, they took a tent fabric, denim was a tent fabric at the time, and they patented putting rivets to reinforce it. Um, and so it was a super technical product for its time, and they were able to build it into this incredibly iconic piece. Um, the other product we thought a lot about was the Burberry trench coat. And when I think about Burberry trench coats, I think of like men in suits or whatever. Um, it's funny, if you, I did a Google image search to get this photo up, and actually 80% of the results are women wearing Burberry trench coats. Now it's just a super fashion item. Um, but the Burberry trench coat actually is called a trench coat because it was made for trench warfare in World War II. It's a hyper-technical garment. Um, Burberry, originally, they, Burberry developed gabardine, the fabric, in the 1800s as a, as a waterproof breathable um, and built a raincoat market. Um, in England, and then when World War I came around, they, they started making these trench coats for the army. And if you break apart, e even ones made today, they sort of have a range of prices you can get them at, but if you get a proper Burberry trench coat, um, it's an incredibly well-engineered piece, and every single detail in there is thought through from very technical reasons, right? Like the, the belt is like incredibly reinforced and has D-rings on it to hang grenades off of. Every, like the, the way the pockets are built, the way the, the flaps are constructed, everything is there for a reason. Um, and it's a fascinating garment. And so, you know, we sort of started thinking like, wow, these, these classic garments, they, they really usually come out of technical innovations and they're coming out of the space that we're really interested in. So we started about thinking about the idea of like, how do, how do we make future classics? Like, how do we take innovations in some way and bring them into our garments? and not just make the exact same silhouette that existed, like our, some of our original stuff was, but, but try and make something new. Um, so this is um, our pivot sleeve shirt, which we, this, this actually came out of like the early bike days when if you lean forward on a bicycle wearing a button up shirt, especially if it's really tailored, like a lot of things happen, like it starts pulling across the back, sometimes you can't reach the handlebars, um, it cuts into your underarm, it pulls out, you know, the sleeve pulls up, shirt pulls out of your pants, it's tucked in and we're like, well, re-engineer this and so this came from like just kind of a lot of studying of of climbing garments climbing jackets but then also looking at the fashion side and like how can we take what's going on in a climbing jacket put it into a button-up shirt in a way that that looks right and gives us the movement we want um, this is one of our favorite products because um, it illustrates sort of the power of the internet which I haven't talked about a lot but we actually went from concept to market with these shorts in five weeks we were sitting around like you know, like the thing with shorts is that like, you know, guys when they find water and it's warm out and they're wearing shorts, they usually jump in and then the, you're wearing these soggy ass shorts all day. <laughs> um, so we're like, what, what about if we just built shorts that like are shorts but will double as a swimsuit? Um, and we had the fabric lying around and, you know, we were in the factory and we kind of came up with the idea and like said, let's do it and sewed it up and stuck it on the internet and started selling them. Um, and it's not just garments, we started looking at other products like towels, we were like, you know, what could be more boring than a towel? Like maybe we could do something there. So we sort of took uh, linen, um, which is this amazing kind of lost technical fabric um, in a way. It's, it's super absorbent, it's super lightweight, it's actually really strong, you know, they used to make rope out of it. Um, it's weak, it, it has a funny weakness, you can't really put it in um, upright washing machines. If you, if you put it in a top loading, or no, you can't put it in a top loading washing machine because the torque um, tear like rips the linen. Um, but if you take care of it, it can last 100 years. Um, and then, you know, we, had, we tackled the, the five pocket pant as well. These are slim dungarees, like just trying to figure out how to re-engineer for the 21st century. Really trying to envision like, you know, when Levi Strauss and Jacob Davis made the first pant, like, you know, 
they weren't trying to make a heritage piece, they were trying to make a technical piece. So we were like, what, what happens when you try and make that for the 21st century? So that's Outlier, you know, we're trying to make the future of clothing. Um, just to sum it up a little bit, uh, you know, sort of what we figured out, and this is what we did, I'm not saying it's what everybody needs to do, but you know, we, we realized almost immediately that going online and direct, and we dabbled with wholesale and stuff, but, but we realized that going online direct was, was really liberating from the idea of making garments. Um, you know, we want to use the best possible materials, that, that's a personal preference, um, but it makes sense. Um, and then we, you know, we sign things, we don't brand them. Um, and, and we study history, but we utilize technology. We, like, and that's basically the outlier in a nutshell. Um, but in terms of like, what I think maybe you should think about taking away, like more than anything, is just online. The internet is completely changing the way clothes get made and sold, right? It's like the complete new territory is the internet. Um, and you know, it's funny, like when we started in 2008, like there were all massive fashion brands that had these one page page, you know, that was it. They had no internet presence. They'd have a splash screen or something. Um, and it's changing really, really fast because it changes the economics, it changes everything. Um, so that's it. That's Outlier. Um, best way to reach me is on Twitter, um, A1X and www.outlier.cc. Thank you. Tell us the meaning behind the swan. Um, a swan is a symbol of an outlier. Um, it's that simple. Black swan, not a swan. Black swan. Um, you, can, you can read about it. It goes. You know, there's a philosophical background for it. But um, you know, there's a saying in the, the as rare as a black swan was an ancient medieval saying. They, it basically meant it didn't exist. But then when the Europeans reached Australia, there were black swans, and they were like, oh, actually. <laughs> It does exist, so you know it's got the, there's philosophy behind it and whatnot. But it's just you know we were like once we had the name outlier, which uh, we were like the swan came really naturally, and uh, and the name has absolutely nothing to do with Malcolm Gladwell. We had it first, you know, um, so <laughs> yeah, over there. Uh, hey, my name is Jeff. I'm from Georgia. I'm a co-founder of Golden Prince. Yeah. And uh, one of the biggest problems we ran into when we first started was the idea of was how did we transition from kind of doing the made to order, you know, pre-order where you're only building products after people have expressed interest yeah. in buying it? How did you make that jump to saying, hey, let's go to the factory and we're going to do this shirt, that, you know, the pivot shirt, we're going to order X amount of pieces? Well, so this is like the, the mixed blessing. Like we started a year before Kickstarter started, so there was that, that option didn't exist when we right. started. Um, and so we were, Putting, we were taking the risk every time, um, and it's economically it's it's difficult. It's one of the, the biggest drawbacks to going online is that, and the reason brands are actually hesitant to do it is because if you're a wholesale brand, a you have relationships with a lot of clients, but b like you're used to getting your orders first and not having to take the inventory risk. So we're online, we take the inventory risk, and um, you know that's the biggest risk we take usually. Is producing product before it's sold. Um, one of the, being in New York City is incredibly helpful because um, the garment district is really flexible and scalable in a way that very few other parts of the clothing world are. So we have the ability to go to, you know, there's factories that we work with that their largest order that they can handle is 100 pieces, right? You know, and then there's factories where, you know, they don't ever want to look at you unless you're talking thousands or ten thousands, right? So, um, and the beauty of the garment district is that scales up to a certain point. You don't have the massive, massive factories, obviously, but there's there's a huge range of scale there, and, and so we're able to utilize that to our advantage. Um, so when we launch something online, we don't have to make a lot of product. We can test it and see if there's demand. Um, the other thing we've learned with online product is that you can't really get a good measure of the demand long term until at least the third release because um, the first release it, it'll tell you immediately if it's a failure if nobody buys it right but um, if it succeeds like and you run out of product then you go make another run and you have pent up demand because you just sold out a product and so it's not really till that third thing that you get a true read of like how many 
people really want to buy this on a consistent basis. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, what's your return um, percentage based on bid or people saying it didn't look like what I thought it might? Uh, it's around 20%, which is, which is for uh, online or direct business, not that bad. You know, Zappos publicly says their returns are about 35%. So. Um, it's a little shocking. Like when we started, it was lower, and so it started growing, and we're, it was weird because it didn't feel unnatural. Um, that was definitely like a learning curve. I'm, I still don't know why it was so low when we started, um, but yeah, it's around 20%. Anybody else? Yeah. Uh, it was about 600 bucks. Yeah, it wasn't that bad, you know. It was uh, a small bolt of fabric and uh, some pattern costs and some sewing costs. I mean, that, that, that not, doesn't include my time. <laughs> yeah. Why didn't you guys stop doing wholesale? Uh, we never did a lot of wholesale because um, we knew that the price would have to go up. Um, so we had a sort of strategy early on that we could do one wholesale account per city. Um, and that was, you know, we thought that would be great for people to be able to touch the product and try it on. And it worked r relatively well, but, um, you know, most of those early shops never provided a great customer experience. Um, and eventually we stopped, really, because we realized we weren't servicing our wholesale accounts the way that they deserve to be serviced. We spent all our time focusing on our online and the wholesale was getting forgotten and we weren't able to, to do it in a way that, we, that they deserve, the stores. Um, we never were able to give them proper margins. Like we were always asked them to get a cut. Well, we actually we learned really early on that a store would much rather take a lower margin than, than sell at a different price than it is online. Um, at first we were we kind of were like, yeah, well, you should charge more because you have all these markup costs that we don't have and nobody liked that. Um, but eventually we just realized that, that we're better off focusing on what we were good at. Um, and the funny thing is it's hard to say because we're, you know, we're growing business, so, but I think that stopping the wholesale actually increased the sales because it, it took out a level of excuse that people, they'd always be like, oh, I could go to that store and try it on and check it out. And um, now that option just doesn't exist. You can either order it online. Um, we open up our studio in Brooklyn every, uh, every Friday for three hours, but other than that, like, you gotta, you gotta buy it. And, you know, we have a great return policy, 45 days, no questions asked, um, you know, pay sh shipping both ways when you return it. So there's no actual financial risk um, in ordering the product, but, you know, it's, it's tricky. It's, it's closed, people like to try them on. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, not coming from a fashion background, yeah. did you just rely Uh, no, I mean, when we started, I just fit it to myself and to Tyler. Was like, and that actually worked well because Tyler's like a slightly different body type. You know, neither of us are really extreme in our body types. We had slightly different body types, you know, if we sort of calibrated between the two. But, um, you know, one of the things I didn't talk about that much, but we, you know, we started doing men's only and quickly, like, we got all these women writing and being like, where's the women's stuff? And so we're like, okay, let's go make a women's product. And that was really, really hard. Um, <laughs> And we learned a lot of lessons. And, but one of the key things is just like, it's not even like, you know, women's bodies are different and there's more variance in women's bodies. Men are, are two dimensional, really. Like, the, it's true. Like, men, the chest depth of men, like, does not change very much. Even like really large guys, like, they, you know, most men have about 10 inch chest depth no matter what, you know? And so you don't have to worry about those kind of variances as much. Um, but the, the core thing is like, it's way easier to design for yourself than to design for somebody else, whether, you know. And so when we started, we were just making what we wanted. And you know, we always try and make stuff that doesn't exist. Like I don't see the point in making something that, that's already out in the market. Um, so, and we knew exactly what was missing from, that we wanted, but when it comes to doing women's stuff, it was a lot, a lot trickier. So how did you calculate? Uh, we, we started hiring women. Um, yeah, you know, it's like we, I mean, we, we kind of got lucky. We just, the first product, like we 
we failed a bunch and then we finally got one successful women's product and we didn't really learn the lesson until we tried to make more women's products like and then that's when we started like we're like okay like the, you know we need to have women designing this not us yeah you said for a long time you, you both had full-time jobs at what point did you kind of make the jump and go do it full-time like what did you need in order to make that you know, kind of career move um we just, it was just, uh, you know, we, we have no outside investors. Me and Tyler both put in like a very small, you know, like like four digit sum of money each, so like that we had saved up. And so it was when we could afford to hire ourselves really. So I think Tyler, we had, a, you know, maybe like 12, 14 months in or something, we, he started working part time at his old job and part time. And then, you know, eventually, you know, a few months later he was full time and then I, it was about two, two and a half years before I was full time. Anyone else? All right, thank you. Thank you.